you've got the control file command, you've got the DFS, DF, DBMS, DFNS. Oh, let me try that again. Cloning databases, here's the question that came in and you know, do clones count as part of my multi-tenant license limit? And licensing is a valid concern of the community. So I wanted to talk about that in terms of cloning. And the simple answer is yes. Anything which is a PDB, anything that counts as a PDB, if you see it in VDollar PDB, literally if it adds up to that, then it is in basically becomes part of your multi-tenant license. So let's give a little bit of background as to how we got to where we are with multi-tenant and its licensing. And, and I often start when I'm talking about multi-tenant about this new, who remembers multi-tenant? It's a bit of a play on words because it is the uh, recommended way forward for all Oracle databases and in 20C it's the only way forward. But I say remember because it's been out now for what since 12C, 12.1 came out, which is what, four or five years. It's been out for a long time and yet it's perhaps not as widely embraced besides the single pluggable, which a lot of people are using uh, because there's no license fee. I think that's sad because multi-tenant is just insanely cool. Think about as a DBA, especially when someone says, oh, can you please copy this database to another database? And it used to be, oh, I've got RMAN, I've got to look for backups, I've got to run a duplicate command, I've got to make sure I've got my control files and my temp files and all that stuff right. Or I'm running data pump, it's three terabytes. I say, come back next week and hopefully it'll be loaded. And then the behavior characteristics are different because you've recreated the data from scratch. When you look at something like this in multi-tenant, where you literally it's a one line command, you know, create pluggable copy from another source. You can do it online, you can do it hot. It's just ridiculously cool. It solves so many of those hassles when people come to you saying, I'd like a copy of a database or there's the ability to have a read-only copy, which is periodically refreshed from source without having to copy the whole thing again. The ability, you know, it's that common request that come from developers. Here I have a copy, can you please bring it up to date? You can do it with multi-tenant. You can even do it across databases. So with a database link, you can have a, data, a pluggable that's refreshed on a regular cycle. So many goodies once you have a multi-tenant system with more than one pluggable. And of course, not enough people use it because the key sentence there was I said more than one pluggable and more than one pluggable means a license. But as I've mentioned in previous office hours, one of the carrots, one of the, uh, I don't have a carrot, but I have an orange ball. That'll have to do. One of the carrots we uh, offered out when we to get people to move to 19C, which is our long term support release, is if you move to 19C on any edition, standard, enterprise, cloud, on-premise, you name it, you can go up to three pluggable databases for absolutely no license fee, no multi-tenant license fee, up to three pluggable databases. So those things I just covered, you know, hot cloning, datable refresh, cross-pluggable cloning, etc., all become available to you, which is really, really cool. People say to me, I'd like more. You know, I want to have more than three pluggables, or I'm not on 19C. I'm on 12C, I'm on 11. I don't want to upgrade it or I can't upgrade it. Can I have clones or can I have more than three clones? And the answer, I believe it or not, is yes as well. And, and I've put sort of here because we can't do it with multi-tenant technology. There are other technologies in the Oracle database that exist that might actually suit your needs here. And that facility is known as CloneDB. And CloneDB has been out for a long, long time. It's just one of those hidden tucked away features that no one has really spoken about that much, which is a pity because I think it's a ridiculously cool. It's been there since 11G, so it's, it's robust, it's tried and true, and as long as you're on a supported version of Oracle, which is 11.2 and above, then you'll be able to run CloneDB. To understand what CloneDB is, we have to backtrack a bit and talk about Direct NFS. Now, to talk about Direct NFS, this is how I came to know about CloneDB because one of the customers I worked with back in 2015, we're using NetApp storage and NetApp is a NAS based storage. And so we were running Oracle over NFS. And one of the very cool pieces of technology that came out back then was Oracle's implementation of NFS called direct NFS. And let me explain briefly what that is and how it leads on to CloneDB. If you're just using an NFS on your operating system 
like a lot of us do, if we're using shared file systems, etc., or we've got a NAS in the corner, etc. Oracle, like any other program on the OS, would talk to the OS. The operating system would then talk to the NFS layer, which often has some sort of caching facilities, which would then be sent down to the database. All of which is just extra layers that slows things down. Every time you do an I.O., it becomes a bit slower. And the last thing you need on a system which has a database cache, the buffer cache and the SGA, is another cache called the NFS client cache, once again doubling up those writes. It's just a ridiculous use of memory and just more layers that actually slows you down. What happened with direct NFS is Oracle's implementation put the NFS layer into the Oracle kernel, therefore removing the need for those elements. You can still have NFS on the box, but Oracle's not going to use it. It's going to use its own implementation. Now you have Oracle talking directly out to a NetApp or any other kind of NAS filer over NFS. That's super cool because now you don't need fiber channel, you don't need expensive switches, you can literally just plug in Ethernet, which is just getting incredibly cheap and ridiculously fast. You've got you know, 10 gig Ethernet, 40 gig Ethernet via bonding, 100 gig Ethernet's coming, terabits around the corner, it's insane. So having a direct NFS implementation gives you all sorts of benefits, even if we're not talking about cloning of databases. But once the database has full control of rights, it's no longer behooven to the operating system to control the rights, it now has the ability to do things like intercept rights, to reroute where they're going. And that leads us on to CloneDB. So the first thing you need to do if you're going to use any kind of cloning technology, CloneDB, is enable direct NFS. Now, here's the example of what you would do on Windows, and it's very similar on terms of Unix. So on Windows, because I'm going to do a Windows demo in a second, you can see you shut the database down, you copy the current Oracle Disk Management Library, ODM19, to a backup, and then you replace it with the Oracle NFS Oracle Disk Management Libraries. That effectively brings in a set of kernel routines that allows direct NFS. On Unix, it's exactly the same, except it's an Oracle home slash lib, and you do it with a symbolic link. Effectively, it's the same thing. I think on Unix, there's even a make command. Uh, you can actually make, INS RDMS make, and it will actually just do the symbolic link for you. But effectively, you're replacing an existing IO library with a direct NFS enabled IO library. So what you need to do then is actually take a full copy of your database first. Now, this takes a little while, so I'm gonna actually start something running and then we'll come back to the slides. So all I'm doing, you can see it actually start as we go. I'm simply starting up a fresh copy of a database in no mount mode, so there's no control files, no nothing, it's just the instance. On Windows, it seems to take a long, long time, so I thought I'd start it now. Let's come back to the slides. In order to have a cloning system, what are the, what are the kind of um, attributes we're looking for? We've got a source copy of our database, and we'd like to be able to take clones of that. With a normal pluggable in multi-tenant, we can take full copies, or we can take what we call snapshot copies, which are just uh, very sparsely provisioned copies. If you've got a full multi-tenant license, you can obviously take an unlimited number of them. We'd like to replicate that facility, but using not multi-tenant and not having to pay a full license fee. To do so, the first thing I need is a full copy of the source database. So I take a full copy of the database plus a copy of the control file. That's what I need, a control file and a full backup, and I put as copy. It's not a backup set. We can't use ARM and backup pieces. We need actual image copies of the data files. Um, I've taken one of them beforehand, and that's what we're going to be using for our cloning. This is all, I, this is all I've done before this call started. I've simply done allocate a channel on RMAN and backup full as copy database and dumped a copy of the control file. It's really all we have to do. And one would imagine this is probably part of your regular backup cycle anyway. I'll put a link in the description. I've already done a video many, many moons ago on Office Hours talking about the benefit of using image copies as opposed to backup sets uh, for your RMAN backups. So this could be something you could just uh, slot straight into your existing backup regime. We can now build with CloneDB, a new database instance, which believe it or not, is using the backup files as database data files. Now you might be thinking, well, doesn't that break that backup? Because the moment I open the database, it's gonna start writing to those data files. This is where direct NFS comes in. We're gonna create a new instance based solely on that backup files, and we will never touch them. We're gonna read from them, but we're never ever gonna write to them. What'll happen is when you have direct NFS enabled, and you're running in a, what we call a clone DB format. You read from that read-only backup. As you try to do writes to the database, 
directing the pest intercepts them and reroutes them somewhere else into effectively a, a, a list of deltas. So what you've got now is the sum total of your database is the read-only backup that you're using, plus all these what we call copy on write, these deltas operations as you make writes to the database. The sum total of that is now a read-write clone of your database, but the only space it's consuming is the deltas because the read-only backup just sits there in place. Only the deltas consume space. Hopefully now my database has started because now we can flick over to the slides and actually look at this in real life action. Let's see. So I've started up a database here. It's just a startup no mount. So there is no database yet. It is just the instance, the memory and the processes running. Here's that full backup. So you can see I've got my four data files. This is a, a non plugable instance. I just wanted to keep it small so the demo would run nice and fast. You can see it's a full image copy backup, sysorg system, undo table space and user. It's a very, very small database just to keep it nice and small. But the sum total here is what? If I have a look, it's 1.12. It's about 2.2 gigabytes in size. That's my backup. That's my read-only backup taken from a source database. This is now where things get interesting. I've started up my database instance. The only thing I've changed about it, besides it being a standard database instance, is I've added a parameter which says clone DB equals true. That's the only thing I have to do. I now create a control file. This is a brand new database called, I call it DB19C, C for clone. Not C for cloud, C for clone in this case. I'm gonna reset logs and it'll be archive log mode. These are brand new ReLogs. Really logs. These don't exist yet. They will be created when I do an open the database with reset logs. And you can see I'm pointing to the backup files. So I'm not pointing to new data files, I'm actually pointing to the read-only backup files. And my control file is created. That takes a database from an instance into mounted mode now. So it now has some data files, even though they are just the actual database backups from another database. This is really all I have to do. I have to tell the database how to intercept writes to the read-only files, the read-only backup, and redirect them somewhere else. So you can see for each file I've got, this is the read-only file. When someone tries to make a write to it, write it here instead. When someone tries to make a write to the sysorg table space, write it here instead. And so forth for undo and so forth for the user table space. This is just a simple anonymous block with the DBMS DNFS package, which is a way of mapping writes to the read-only files and rerouting them somewhere else. That's done. Now, just to prove that you know this is a normal database, that read-only, that backup I took, I took when the database was open. You don't have to shut, it doesn't have to be a clean backup, it can be a fuzzy backup. But what that means is this new database I'm creating obviously needs to be recovered. It, you know, those files are actually not in sync with each other. So I have to do a recover database. Recover database using backup control file. For the purpose of demo, I actually knew what the name of the data, the uh, archive file was, so I directly typed it in, and we can, and then I recovered it, and I simply cancelled my media recovery. So I've just done normal database recovery to take advantage of the fact that my full backup was taken in online mode, and my database is now up to date, and I do alter database open reset logs. So it's creating some log files, and there we go. This system is actually all done. How cool is that? So there we go, my database is open. This is my clone database, and there we go, it's all running. If I go interrogate this database, it says it's about 2.1 gigabytes in size, at which point you might be thinking, oh, that's a bit worried that, you know, have I cloned the entire copy of the database? If I go look in the actual uh, X Oracle NFS system, it also says these so-called deltas, these meant to be small files are also the full size of the database. It looks like two gigs as well. But I've said check the real space, and that's why I brought up an Explorer window beforehand. And right click on the NFS folder and choose properties. So hopefully you can see that. It says, yes, we have 2.1 gigabytes, but the actual size on disk is only 576K. So even though if I cancel that off, remove that, even though the database says, even on the operating system level, that it's two gigabytes, these are actually what we call sparse files. They actually aren't occupying that space. It's only occupying about half a megabyte. And in fact, if I go into this database, and like, just to prove that it is a read-write database, I'll create a copy of a table called T, which is a copy of DBA objects. I'll copy a table called T1, also a copy. So I've written some stuff to the database. Let's go back to our Oracle NFS. 
and we can see it's now gone from 576K on disk to 29.1 megabytes on disk, which is about two times DBA objects in terms of size. So while the listing says it's two gigabytes, it actually has only consumed 29 megabytes to have a full copy, inverted commas, a full clone of my original database. So that's very cool. What we have is now is this facility where I can take a clone and you can see I rolled the archives forward so I can actually roll that database forward a little bit and it takes up very little space, only the amount of space that'll be used for any subsequent updates. One thing I'm not gonna show on the demo because my PC probably just won't be able to cope with it is the database never has any exclusive access or exclusive locks on those read-only database backup files. I can create hundreds of clones off that one common set of data files. And what's more, as you saw, because I rolled the clone forward using archive logs, I could have, for example, a backup taken on Sunday. On Monday, I could give someone a clone and roll that backup forward through to Monday's archive logs. I could give someone else a clone and leave it at Sunday. I could give someone else a clone on Wednesday and roll that clone through to all Wednesdays and still leave the other person running a clone at Mondays. There is no limit to the number of clones you can have besides simply the available space. And the only space that's gonna be consumed is deltas. And there's obviously no restrictions on what point in time, as long as it's at the point of time of the full backup or afterwards. That's very, very cool. That's CloneDB. You get an unlimited number of copies from the same backup. And obviously if you had multiple backups from multiple systems, there's no limit. The only thing this is really costing you is a tiny bit of disk space for the deltas. Obviously the more writes you do, the more deltas can space you consume and the cost of creating an instance. Each one is a brand new instance, which means it needs its own SGA and its own processes. But as long as you've got plenty of memory and these things are probably not gonna be used you know, for industrial strength applications, they're gonna be great for building a clone, doing a unit test, throwing it away, doing some integration testing, giving a developer a sandbox, you know, so many useful things when you have a throwaway copy of a critical mission critical database. That's very, very cool. And as I said, each one can be in different points as time as well. So that's cloning DB with no multi-tenant license restrictions, unlimited number of clones. They can be sparse copies. As you can see, it works on Windows. It works on Unix as well. And all you need to do is activate direct NFS and use the clone DB equals true parameter in init.ora. You've got the control file command. You've got the DFS, DF, DBMS, DFNS. Oh, let me try that again. You've got the, you've got the contra create control file command and the dbms underscore dnfs package which lets you do the rerouting of data files and you're good to go it's very very cool